Hello, everybody. Welcome to this new edition of Tomaski Cast. I'm Michael Tomaski. I'm the editor of the New Republic. Uh, this is a production of New Republic Video, and I am joined by author, New York Times bestselling author, and journalist Craig Unger. Craig, hello. Hi, Mike. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for being with me, Craig. Uh, you see his book behind uh, his uh, shoulder on the shelf there. Uh, American Compromise is his most recent book. Uh, before that, House of Trump, House of Putin. Both of those uh, uh, digging very deep into uh, the relationship between Donald Trump and not only uh, and Putin, but and uh, Russia and uh, the Soviet Union going back to the 1980s and KGB and so on. Before that, House of Bush, House of Saud, uh, New York Times bestseller. So he's been looking at relationships between the American right and uh, autocrats and authoritarians uh, of various kinds for a long, long time. Uh, so I want to talk, Craig, about Trump and the right uh, and, and Russia over the years. But first, let's just talk about the House of Putin side of this equation. So you've thought a lot more about this man than most of us have. Uh, what do you think his state of mind is right now? And how worried should we all be about his state of mind? Well, I think we should be very worried. And, and to me, the most striking thing of all really is, that, you know, when I started uh, working on these two books, what was astonishing to me was the whole concept of hybrid warfare and how effective and how efficient it was. Mm -hmm. And the idea that by using disinformation operations, by doing active measures uh, and uh, 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 all the things we saw happen during the 2016 election, that uh, Putin was able to have a Russian intelligence asset in the White House in the name of Donald Trump. And he did that with that. I mean, it, it always occurred to me if he tried to do that with old fashioned military warfare, boots on the ground, you know, bombs, bullets, boots on the ground, that that would have been a disaster. Uh, and instead, he was incredibly effective at disarming the United States uh, and, and really uh, crippling NATO during the entire Trump presidency. Yeah. Now, we've seen he's reverted to the old form of war warfare, and it's incredibly clumsy, it's brutal, it's expensive, and it's not being very effective, and he's losing. So I suspect he's getting uh, pretty desperate there now. And we saw the first... Uh, major resignation, and uh, I believe it was Anatoly Shabai who, who resigned. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, tell, I- Tell people who he is. He, uh, well, he was one of the great uh, uh, economists in, in the transition who, who Putin relied on. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you, you just see, um, I, it, it's hard to know. I don't have real specific information in terms of how isolated Putin is, but he's got to realize, uh, some of the oligarchs have to realize uh, what a, a failure the invasion has been. And, and I, I just wonder how that will play out, whether it will collapse, whether his only uh, strategy is uh, to... Um, uh, to escalate, to de-escalate, as is often said on TV. That, that's part of their, their doctrine. It looks like they're going back to the old brutal war doctrine that, that, that they've used in the past. And if, that, if escalating means using uh, tactical nukes, I mean, we can see this spiraling way, way, way out of control yeah. quite easily. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the oligarchs. Uh, talk a bit about what that relationship what those relationships are really like. I think most of us assume that the oligarchs uh, just do Putin's bidding, bidding and dance to his tune, but does it work in the reverse at all too? I mean, what, uh, how symbiotic and, and twisted are those relationships? Well, it is symbiotic, but but Putin has always been in control and he's been rather brutal. As Mikhail Khodorkovsky found out, yeah. Um, as, as, as various others do. If you don't do your bidding, you're, you're in jail or you're out or you may die mysteriously or be poisoned or whatever. Yeah. So he, he's been a, a, a brutal taskmaster, but I think one of the key elements in it is that uh, a lot of the oligarchs represent uh, uh, 
total domination in sectors where, where they have strategic resources. So if you take a truly rich and powerful oligarch uh, like Oleg Deripaska, well, he is the he's sort of the winner of the aluminum wars, which are very brutal and bloody. And aluminum is very much a strategic resource, especially in aerospace. Yeah. So when he controlled the aluminum industry in Ukraine, well, that meant that uh, the Russians had uh, a lot of power over the Ukrainian Air Force. Mm -hmm. And when you saw Deripaska trying to make a deal with Mitch McConnell to build a aluminum, uh, mine, do aluminum uh, mining in uh, uh, Kentucky. I mean, just think what that means. If the United States is getting its aluminum and it's owned by Russia, and that aluminum is supposed to go into the aerospace industry, do we really want a Russian oligarch uh, having power over uh, our air force or, or even our commercial jets? Yeah. Uh, th that's enormously powerful. And, and what you have to wonder now is now that really serious sanctions are being imposed, uh, what will be the blowback towards uh, Putin? And that could be quite real. I, I don't think anyone really knows how it's going to play out at this stage. So these oligarchs do have some leverage over him in the form of their wealth, their control, their domination of certain sectors, and the fact that their you know, yachts are being taken away now. Right. And I, can, I think they can be disempowered by these sanctions. I mean, I, I don't think it's much fun being a billionaire if you're stuck in Siberia. If you can't yeah. get out of Russia, you can't spend your money in the West. Right. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and um, speaking of yachts, I assume you saw what they what some people identified as Putin's yacht. Uh, talk about what you know about to be the extent of his his own wealth. It's is he the richest man in the world? Well, he said to be have more than two hundred billion dollars at various times. I don't think anyone can really compute it. I, you know, I, I think there's a lot more work to be done in terms of so much dark money. If you, if you know uh, the work of James Henry, the economist, uh, he said there's more than twenty to thirty trillion dollars in dark money out there. And if you imagine what kind of power that is, that's like twice. Uh, the GDP of the United States or something. And so I think with it comes uh, a certain amount, a, a huge amount of geopolitical power. And it's just sort of out there for the taking. And this has been one of the great problems with trying to control a, a mafia state. And especially as we have uh, our own vulnerabilities, thanks to uh, Citizens United and, and various rulings like that, which allow huge amounts of money in the United States, you can see a lot of that money entering our electoral system. And you have people uh, like Leonard Blavatnik, who uh, is a naturalized American citizen. Uh, he's a billionaire. At one point, I know he, he said to have $16 billion. And he's made huge contributions to Mitch McConnell's uh, Republican Senatorial uh, Campaign Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, so that just is, is just opening the doors to this kind of corruption. And it's one reason that I think you see that the Republican Party has an effect become Putin's party. And, and by the way, Putin did this as a dry run in Ukraine years ago with none other than Paul Manafort at the helm. Right. And uh, it, it was really exactly the same starting around 2004. Yeah. So he's tested this out before. Yeah, well, that's, you've been writing about that for the New Republic, two recent pieces since the war started, terrific pieces that people should look at. Uh, so l let's go back now through that history. Um, what drew the Republican Party or certain figures within the Republican Party to uh, post-Cold War Russia? Well, I, you know, some of it, it, it's happened gradually. I mean, I go back with uh, Donald Trump to 1980. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in 1980, uh, he was had his first major success as a real estate developer, one of his few real genuine successes. It's the Grand Hyatt Hotel right next to Grand Central Station. And like any hotel, uh, it needed lots of TV sets and he bought it from uh, uh, an electronic store owned by, uh, co-owned by a Soviet emigre named Semyon Kislin. Mm -hmm. And Kislin, according to one of my sources, uh, Yuri Schwitz was a former KGB agent. 
And according to Yuri, uh, Kinslin was a so-called spotter agent for the KGB. He had, uh, his job was to spot new talent, people he could cultivate to uh, essentially become assets for the KGB. And when he sold several hundred TV sets to Donald Trump, that was in effect opening the door to Donald Trump. It allowed the first contacts of the KGB uh, to meet with Trump and to invite him to what was then the Soviet Union in 1987. And that's how it began. That's how it began with Trump. But let's let's talk about others, others in the Republican Party, because you you have a lot of stuff about many other figures. Right. Well, uh, as I mentioned, you, you have people like Leonard Blavatnik uh, uh, making his contributions to uh, Mitch McConnell. Um, you have, uh, um, uh, you know, I go back to uh, uh, Dana Rohrabacher and Kurt Weldon, who were two of Putin's favorite Congress people. Uh, you know, you, you have Ed Buckham, who, who was uh, chief of staff to Tom DeLay back when Tom DeLay was, uh, I guess he was House, was a majority whip or a minority whip? Uh, yeah, major, majority, uh, yeah, majority whip, yeah, or, or leader, he was majority leader while, while Hastert was speaker. Right, and uh, they, they had a, a, a junket to Moscow. It was a six day junket with uh, all the luxuries you can imagine uh, and a million dollar check ended up coming through one of these super tip packs. It was called the U.S. Uh, United States Family Network. Uh, mm -hmm. It was just a vehicle to take in money and funnel it to Tom DeLay. And Ed Buckham uh, helped orchestrate the whole thing. And of course, now today, he ends up as chief of staff to Marjorie Taylor Greene. Uh, you know, it, it, it's funny when you start doing, when I start doing this research, you just, you know, it's simple Googling. You I said, well, who is Ed Buckham? I've never really heard of him before. Yeah. And you see the whole timeline sort of uh, appears almost magically. And, and there really are hundreds of Republicans who end up one way or another getting money from uh, the Russian Federation or, or through various oligarchs. Uh, how do they get this money? I mean, it, it's illegal for them to receive campaign money. So how's it how's it coming through? Right. Well, uh, as I mentioned, Blavatnik is, is a naturalized Ameri uh, American citizen. Uh, so right. that went into a super PAC. Yeah. Um, uh, you have uh, uh, Open Secrets has a file. I, I, I saw and they went back. These are the last six years. And I believe the figure was over one hundred and eighty million dollars coming in from Russians, uh, major Russian corporations to uh, uh, to various super PACs. Um, you have a huge wait, 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 180 million dollars in six years, right? And that and that predates, uh, you know, it, it occurred to me only afterwards. I wish I put this in the piece, but it, it's after Manafort's work in Ukraine, yeah. And Manafort got 75 million dollars working in Ukraine going through his companies, yeah. so without even breaking a sweat, you're up to 250 million dollars, yeah. And, and that gets to be real money. Yeah. there uh, over time uh and i am sure that's there's much much more than that yeah wow and and um what have the republicans done in return <laughs> they've done an awful lot in return they've done everything Putin wants i mean and and you started seeing it of course uh in the 2016 collection when the uh, convention when they uh uh weakened the ukraine plank Right. Uh, it, it was all, you know, unfortunately, my last book finished before, uh, well, uh, uh, before January 6th and before the invasion of Ukraine. Yeah. But that's effectively what the, what the Republicans were, were opening the doors to. And it was all uh, in very much in Russia's interest. Yeah. Yeah. And then, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and then Trump comes along and. Um, they just can't believe their good fortune. Absolutely. Um, I, you know, I don't think, and I, obviously, it, cultivating Trump started before Putin was even, uh, it, it was back in Soviet days. It was well before Putin's ascendancy. Yeah. And uh, he sort of lucked into it, I think, more than anything. But the KGB 
Uh, I mean, now it's called the FSB, of course, but it, it, it didn't miss a trick. Um, what, what's been sort of astonishing is how, how horrible their intelligence has been uh, now that they've invaded Ukraine. And, yeah. and it seems uh, like uh, they're playing a completely different game. Yeah, yeah, it really has. So, so back to Trump. So just tell people a bit about that history. Uh, you started with the purchase of all the TVs for the hotel, and then throughout the rest of the 80s, he gets closer and closer with KGB sources. Right. After buying the TVs, that had opened the door for various KGB people. And he ended up meeting with a woman named Natalia Dubinina. Uh, Natalia Dubinina was the daughter of uh, the Russian ambassador first, uh, or rather the Soviet ambassador first to the United Nations and later the United States. But she worked in the United Nations uh, in the library of the United Nations General Assembly. And if, if you go back through the clips of the mid eighties, that was famous for being a, a nest for hundreds of Russian spies. If you worked in the library uh, for the Soviet mission to the UN, mm -hmm. uh, you were most likely uh, working for the KGB. Uh -huh. And she met with, with, with Donald Trump. And after that, it was uh, General Gromakov, I believe was his name, with, of KGB, orchestrated Trump's first trip to the Soviet U Union. Yeah. And when he returned, suddenly he was full of all these uh, KGB talking points that were quite extraordinary. Uh, again, my source, Yuri Schwitz, was in the uh, KGB at the time. He was at Washington Station, and his colleagues in New York st Station for the KGB were recruiting Trump. So Yuri went back to Moscow to the KGB uh, counterintelligence headquarters in Yasinevo. And while he was there, uh, Trump uh, was also in Moscow. And though we don't know specifically what was told to him at, the point, at that point, Yuri was indoctrinating his sources with talking points. And sure enough, when Trump came back to the United States, he suddenly ran, made an abortive run for president. And this was a weird time in Trump's life because he was uh, just becoming friendly with uh, Jeffrey Epstein. They were having parties. There was one party for 30 people, two guys, Epstein and Trump and 28 young girls. And suddenly in this atmosphere, uh, Trump goes to reporters at the Washington Post, New York Times and so forth. And he starts spouting off like he's this a uh, great expert on foreign policy, and then he wants to negotiate uh, the salt talks with the Soviet Union, which is mm -hmm. absurd beyond belief. Yeah. Um, and when he, in the, the fall of 87, remember at the time, uh, Reagan is president, George H.W. Bush is vice president, but he's running, he's the, running for president. And in yeah. fact, one is president in the next election. But Trump decides to, he may challenge him for the Republican nomination. And he actually goes to New Hampshire and does some of those rites of passages at the local coffee shops and all that stuff. And he takes out an ad uh, that he, a full page ad that he places in the New York Times, the Washington Post and the Boston Globe. And it's got one talking point after another that is uh, coming right out of the KGB. And it includes things like we, we've got it. It's an attack on NATO. It's, uh, we, you know, our allies aren't delivering for us. We, our alliance with Japan isn't worth pursuing. We've got to clamp down on Japan. Well, this, this was never a big issue in the United States. I mean, I went back through the clippings of, uh, you know, U.S.-Japanese foreign policy just was never really a, a headline making thing. And where is Trump getting this? Well, it was a big deal within the KGB. Mm -hmm. And uh, sure enough, Trump takes it out in these ads and uh, Yuri Schwitz, who is back in Yasinevo at KGB headquarters, and he's getting uh, all this sort of internal documents from the KGB. And one of them is a, a, a cable from the active measures departing, department celebrating a very, very successful active measure in which they have disinformation being placed in New York and, and Washington papers 
And sure enough, it's that full page ad signed by Donald Trump. Wow. And they said, we've recruited a new asset, uh, according to Yuri. Uh, and it's just extraordinary. I mean, I grew up, uh, I, when my favorite movie as a kid was uh, um, uh, The Manchurian Candidate. And the idea of having a, uh, an agent in the White House, uh, the idea that they could have pulled it off is just extraordinary. Wow. Donald Trump is the warmest, kindest, most wonderful man. Um, <laughs> Uh, for those who've seen the movie. Uh, so let's talk about now. So he comes out and he calls this uh, invasion an act of genius. Uh, now he's backed off and now he's talking tough. Uh, uh, you know, that Putin would never would have done this if he'd been in the White House and, and so on and so on. Uh, what, you, what, what's, what's Trump's game now? Well, I don't know. I think he may be uh, hurt tremendously by this because, I, I, I mean, you're seeing a lot of uh, Republicans do a quick 180 on Russia and Putin, right. and it, it's not very convincing. I mean, it has to be done. Well, I mean, I, I, I think their line on it is it's Biden's fault because Biden is weak and Trump was tough and it never would have happened. Yeah, I, I think if Trump had been in the White House, I mean, we know this from the Washington and post reporting that he, he planned to get out of NATO and he'd done an awful lot to destroy it. And I can only think if, if he had pulled out of NATO, uh, we'd be seeing a very, very different kind of war now because uh, NATO really did pull that together. That's where I think Biden has been terrifically successful is in pulling NATO back and, and walking that fine line between trying to avoid escalating it, but giving Ukraine as much as we can uh, in terms of military support. Um, so, uh, but I, I, I think if, if Trump were in office now, uh, it would be real trouble because I, I don't know that NATO would, NATO would have not really had the United States. What is the United, what is NATO without the United States? You have fairly small countries. Uh, Germany is now rearming. Would it have done that with, um, uh, without us? I, I, I don't really know, but, um, and fortunately, we don't have to live in that reality. Yeah, well, we might in a couple of years. I mean, <laughs> it's something to worry about. It really he, is. What, what do you think he'll do uh, if he gets back to the White House with regard to policy toward Russia, even uh, after this? Yeah, um, it's hard to speculate on that. I, I, I think he's, uh, I mean, if it were Trump, I, I mean, the other thing is it, it may be someone would it be Ron DeS, would it be DeSantis running or who who the who the hell knows? Um, oh, well, but, let's say it's Trump. Yeah, let's say Trump's the president again. Right. Well, then then we are not. Then America is not. If Trump is president, America is not a reliable partner in NATO, and that means NATO is not really. Uh, what it was said, what it what it's been during my entire lifetime. Uh, what it, what I think we do see that it's sort of promising is you, you see a, a more united Europe coming out of this, especially among the frontline states. So you see uh, Germany starting to rearm. That's sort of extraordinary. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I think if you lived in Germany, and and the Russians have got to fear that. I mean, you have an enmity going back. Uh, centuries there, so yeah. so that's something that, that that's very dangerous. Um, but uh, uh, you know what? How this would play out with with Trump at the helm? God is it, very very scary. Uh, good chance the United States would leave NATO, don't you think? Absolutely, no. Well, Trump ha has said it. I mean, I I think he acted the part while he was president. Everything he did was anti-NATO. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I, I've written a lot critically about American aggressions in the past. I mean, the West has done a lot, but NATO is there for defense. And the one time Article 5 has ever been invoked uh, was after 9-11, when we, when we were genuinely attacked. And, and now we can see, uh, when, when you see Ukraine being invaded, you see the reason for NATO's being. Uh, that's why it should be there. Uh, last question, uh, again, the Republican Party more broadly. Now, most of them are, are 
behaving reasonably responsibly, except for Marjorie Taylor Greene and a handful of others. Uh, but how strong do you suspect the secret pro-Putin sentiment is not only among congressional Republicans, but uh, among the Republican rank and file? How many people do you think really secretly kind of believe the Tucker Carlson line? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I can put a percentage uh, figure <laughs> on it, but I, I, I think, you know, I like to follow the money. And I said, we, we already accounted for at least $250 million. And I think that's a, a small portion of it. And I think one of the things that is essential in all this is for uh, the operation kleptocrat to go after the United, what, how that works within the United States. Mm -hmm. I mean, another part in which, uh, sector in which you see enormous parts of this are the huge uh, white shoe law firms like Jones and Day and uh, Kirkland and Ellis. And they have uh, very, very powerful Russian uh, clients, multi-billionaires and so forth, and uh, oil and uh, all the, all the uh, oligarchs. So, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I haven't done full real reporting on, on how that's being enforced yet, and it, it's still very much an early, early days underway. But you have to, I, I mean, that, that's got to stop. That's got to come to a stop because that money ends up getting into Republican coffers as well. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it gets spread around to uh, uh, Republican candidates and lob through lobbying and all sorts of things. Yeah. That's a lot of money, like you say. Listen, Craig Unger, Unger thank you so much for joining me. Well, thanks for having me, Mike.